Welcome to episode 260 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about as part of this episode at 7. So the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 260. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. I'm a nutritionist who specializes in recovery from disordered eating and eating disorders, or really just helping anyone who has a messy relationship with food and body and exercise. So today's show is a guest interview, and today's guest is Joanna Candle. So Joanna is the founder and CEO of the National Alliance for Eating Disorders and the author of Life Beyond Your Eating Disorder. She founded the Alliance after a decade-long battle with various eating disorders, and since founding the Alliance in October 2000, she has brought information and awareness about eating disorders to hundreds of thousands of individuals nationally and internationally. In addition, she facilitates weekly support groups, mentors individuals with eating disorders and their families through their treatment and recovery and helps thousands of people to gain information and to find the help they need. As a passionate advocate for mental health and eating disorder legislation, Joanna has spent a lot of time meeting with numerous members of Congress and was part of the first ever eating disorder roundtable at the White House. So I've been aware of the Alliance for a while now, but it was only recently that I read Joanna's book, Life Beyond an Eating Disorder, and I really enjoyed it. And so I wanted to have her on the show to talk about it. And so as part of the episode, we talk about Joanna's eating disorder and what her recovery looked like. She quit ballet and then started studying psychology. We talk about how she founded the Alliance and how this has grown and changed over the last 21 years. And then we cover many topics from her book and some of the wonderful exercises and analogies that she shares. So there's a lot of practical ideas with this one. And Joanna is clearly someone who is very passionate about eating disorder recovery. And there is so much of the book that we didn't get to cover. So if you enjoy this conversation and the ideas that she shares, then I suggest checking it out. I'll be back at the end with a recommendation, but for now, let's get on with the show. Here is my conversation with Joanna Candle. Hey, Joanna. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to have this conversation. So yeah, there is a lot that I want to chat about with you today. I've read your book, Life Beyond Your Eating Disorder, which I really enjoyed, and there's lots of exercises and analogies in that that I'd love to share with listeners. And then I also want to chat about the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness and everything that the Alliance is is doing. And yeah, I guess just a starting place, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself? So who you are, what you do, what training you've done, that kind of thing. Sure. So as as you shared, my name is Joanna. I am the founder and CEO of the National Alliance for Eating Disorders, which for the first 21 years of its life was the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness. And we have grown into the largest U.S.-based nonprofit organization that does education, referrals to care, and support for individuals experiencing eating disorders as well as their loved ones. I came to this work um, as someone of lived experience. Uh, For over a decade, I experienced um, my own eating disorders. And I say eating disorders because it wasn't only one type as, you know, for many folks that will experience these disorders, it's never, seems to never just be one. And so my, my struggle started at the age of 11 and a half. I struggled with restricting anorexia nervosa, and then it morphed into bulimia nervosa and then binge eating disorder. Then at, at the tail end really worked itself in to orthorexia. And, you know, the thing is, is I I experienced an eating disorder at a time where there wasn't a lot of conversations being held just like this. There wasn't humans like you, Chris, that were, you know, amplifying this message that individuals experience eating disorders, that there is help, that there is hope that people can and do recover. During my day, uh, there's a channel here in the U.S. called Lifetime, and it's a very, like, feel good, you know, TV channel. And the only time that we ever talked about eating disorders was these after school specials. And something that was really unfortunate was it was the same story being told. The three stories that there were, they were all very similar. 
they all like adhered to this archaic stereotype of who developed eating disorders and what they looked like. Um, as you can imagine, it, it was, you know, a very thin Caucasian, yeah. uh, middle to upper class female identifying young woman. And, you know, for some of my experience, I did relate to that very truthfully, yeah. but for a lot of my experience, I didn't. And so the only person that I had ever known that had experienced an eating disorder that had talked about it was Karen Carpenter, right? And yep. so many people probably listen to this podcast don't even know who she is. So um, a beautiful, amazing singer who lost her life to her eating disorder. And so that's really the message that I had, right? Like that that's what people with eating disorders do. They would lose their lives or they would just struggle forever. And unfortunately, due to many circumstances, one that my family didn't have, you know, the the funds to pay for for treatment out of pocket uh, yeah. because insurance here in the US, you know, was very terrible and still is to some extent covering the treatment of eating disorders. My eating disorder, I, I never got access to care. Also, um, because of the lack of education for our healthcare providers, you know, no one interjected and said, hey, I think what's happening is that you're experiencing an eating disorder. I mean, I was actually in the hospital at the age of 17 in the cardiac care unit and no one said the word eating disorder to me. Like they didn't even find it odd that, you know, here I was 17 and everyone else on the floor was in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And what makes it so unbelievable is that our clinical director now at the Alliance, who's my dear friend and mentor, was actually on staff at that hospital and was one of the few, you know, psychologists that, wor that worked in the hospital settings that worked with eating disorders. And so, there were so, so many opportunities, Chris, for me to have intervention, for me to get access, and it never happened. And so when I finally started reaching out for help, and unfortunately, you know, my story is not, is not very, um, it, it's very similar to a lot of people, right? Sure. Um, so I went to a clinician at a community care organization and had no experience in the treatment of eating disorders and looked at me and she said, you know, Joanna, I'm really happy that you're here. I just need to tell you that you're going to be struggling with your eating disorder forever. Once you have an eating disorder, you always have one. And <laughs> I, I understand where she was coming from on some level. I want to give her that. Yep. But in that moment, when you are when you have no hope, right? And you have this little flicker of, I'm going to reach out and ask for help. As you can imagine, in that moment, she completely squashed that hope. And I basically said, well, if it if I'm not going to get better, then why am I here, right? If I'm going to be struggling with this forever. And so continue yeah. to act out concurrently, like many people, I had a co-occurrence of anxiety. My anxiety was there from the as much as I can remember, depression, um, I did have two suicide attempts um, in my in my journey, but I will tell you that I finally was able to connect to a therapist who had lived experience, who was specialized in the treatment of eating disorders, and it was a game changer for me, a literal game changer. And I really, really thought because my brain was so black and white, was all extremity, right? It's all or nothing, this or that, that if I was going to be in my eating disorder, I was going to be fully in my eating disorder, if I was going to be in recovery, I was going to be fully in recovery. But, you know, my journey to recovery was not a linear process. It wasn't a straight line. It was such a mess. And yeah. it really, truly really was one step forward, three steps back, two steps forward, four steps back. But it wasn't about the steps back. It wasn't about the trips and the falls. It was about what happened after the trips and the falls. It was, was happened like if I got up and when I got up with the help of my supports. And that's truly where my recovery started. And I I do consider myself recovered. That is the, yeah. the terminology I connect with personally. That doesn't mean that anybody else needs to. And, and I mean, hell, you know, I mean, we don't even have a definition of recovery, right? But for me, I'm living my life completely beyond my eating disorder. And it's yeah. now been 23 years. So, and here I am. Nice. Okay. Well, that that was a good sort of snapshot to start with, and I'd like to fill in some of that a little a little bit more. And so, I know in the book you you mentioned about your father being a, a Holocaust survivor, and so I just yes. wanted to get a sense of like how did this play out in in your relationship, and and how he saw the world, and how he saw the world through you. 
Sure. Such a great question. So, um, so yes, my father is a Holocaust survivor. There is so much research, um, on the effects of transgenerational trauma on individuals, how it plays out with the development of an eating disorder. There is such a high incidence rates of children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors that will develop eating disorders, substance use, you know, and the way that it showed up in my house was that the Holocaust was always a part of my household, even though we never talked about it. Like a word was never but it was felt, it was palpable. My, the, the way that it, it showed up in, in the, the, in the terms of my father and I is my, my father, I love him very much and was completely void of any affection, any connection. There was only one way to be and it was perfect in his eyes. So when I was um, born, you know, I was, my, my parents only child that I was going to be a, the, the person that they fought so hard to survive through, right? They emigrated yeah. from, from Europe. They came here. They built a life, you know, very much first generational story, but he wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nuclear physicist. Like that was the three things. And, you know, very much like, I mean, I have these memories of very few and far between, but when he would pick me up at school, it wasn't just a, like a jovial conversation. It was, let's do our multiplication tables. Let's recite poetry. Let's do, it was always, you have to be the best. When I would get a 98 on my test, it wouldn't be a, you know, you got an A that's wonderful. It was, why did you get one wrong? So it was always this relationship. Never, never was compassionate, never gave me hugs, never gave me affection. So that's really how it showed up in the context and started this narrative. And and please know, I'm not blaming my father on any level. It's just, it's the situation that unfolded in my household is it created this narrative internally that maybe if I was perfect, maybe then my father would say, I love you. Maybe then my dad would say, I'm proud of you. And so for me, it was be a, be a perfectionist in every situation, right? In school and being a perfect child. And then for me is, well, maybe if I have the perfect body, maybe I have the perfect, you know, everything, maybe then it'll be okay for me to, to be worthy of love and affection. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I guess when you started later on studying psychology, like starting to understand Dan, is it at a different level? Oh, completely. And I will tell you, it's still, I mean, I still, I, I fully believe I should say that I think everyone should be in therapy. I think it is the best thing. Like, I, I don't yeah. think that there needs to be something wrong for us to go to therapy. Just how when you go to your, you know, your, your doctor once a year, it's not because there's something wrong. Hopefully it's because it's preventative. It's, it's just to make sure everything is okay. And, you know, I mean, it's actually still something to this day that, we talk about like in my therapy sessions, because I now have a daughter who he's completely opposite to. Like he (laughs) is so uh, embraceive and says, I love you and hugs her. And, you know, I have to uh, very, very honestly say that, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, maybe it really is me. And I, it's this understanding of all the work that we've done together, all the work that he's done. He's nearing the end of his life. Like a lot of stuff has happened, but you know, you can know it in your, in your mind. And I think so much for individuals experiencing eating disorders, like they are the smartest individuals I've ever had the opportunity and the, the luck to meet. And yet there's this disconnect between your head and your heart of, I know that what happened to him. And yet as a 11 year old, you know, small child, just wanting to uh, be loved and and say that like that that you are loved that you are supported that that your family is proud of you there really was that complete disconnect and and worked very hard as an adult to try to mend that and heal that and get that connection yeah yeah definitely and i mean th- those early years are so formative and as you say exactly. like you can understand something intellectually but to like truly kind of feel it in your bones is is a different thing Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so one of the other things that seemed fairly like a big component as, as part of your eating disorder, and maybe this is something that is a little more stereotypical is, is like ballet. So, so talk yes. about the, the ballet mm-hmm. piece and, and how this had the role in, in your eating disorder. 
Yeah. So when I started walking, I walked with my feet turned in. I walked pigeon toed. And so my parents thought it would be a good thing to take me to ballet, to give me poise, to turn my feet out. And, you know, much to their chagrin, I completely was enamored with ballet. It was, I mean, as a a four-year-old little girl, three, four-year-old little girl, you know, I mean, the epitome of what a princess is, is like, you know, a ballerina with pink tights and a tutu and tiara. And I just loved it. And I happened to be given the gift of being a very good dancer. And so, you know, I went to a professional academy at at an early age and was dancing all the time and got opportunities to dance in New York during the summers at School of American Ballet, at New York City Ballet. And so there was a lot of pressure on me to be that successful successful dancer, right? And the summer between um, between two grades, I remember I'd just come home from New York and I was in my ballet class and I was with girls that were, because my class at the time was all female identifying um, people. Yeah. Um, they were about four to five years older than me, just to give you an idea. And the artistic director of the professional ballet company came in and said, we're doing a brand new production of The Nutcracker. We want you all to audition to dance with a corps de ballet. And then she concluded by saying, but before the audition, we want you all to lose some weight. (laughs) And I was, I was very young at the time. I didn't know anything about weight loss. Um, you know, I had read some of my mom's magazines and, you know, at that time, the the big fad was everything was fat free. Like don't eat fat. Fat was bad. Like now I think it's more carbs and gluten and all of that stuff, you know? And so I, I, I got whole, I, I got, my mother picked me up from ballet. I got in the car and I told her that I was going to eat healthy. I was going to eat fruits and vegetables. And, you know, at the time I, I didn't consume those things. Um, and also now being a child of a very picky eater, a mother of a very picky eater, that's what my, my, my daughter is. It was like music to her ears. I mean, what parent doesn't want to hear their child say, I'm going to eat like healthfully. And, you know, this is where I, I say to people, you know, the path to hell is filled with good intentions. Like I didn't say to my mother, I'm going to develop anorexia nervosa. I just wanted to better myself. I wanted to dance. I wanted to get the role. I wanted to be successful. And if I had to lose weight, which I didn't because I was so small compared to everyone else, I was going to do it because it's this mentality of winning at all costs, doing whatever it takes to succeed that not only is super embraced by the ballet world, and I would say athletics and so many other other areas, right? But also the characteristics of individuals that experience eating disorders also have those sets of rules internally. Yeah. And, you know, that's what happened. I started eating healthfully and moving my body a little bit more. And unfortunately, I auditioned and... I was the only person in my ballet class that didn't get the roles and they pulled me aside and they said, you know, Joanna, you didn't, you didn't get the parts because you were not good enough. On the contrary, it's just that you look so young compared to everyone else. And that was the first time in my, my life that I experienced that very nasty game of telephone that so many individuals that experience eating disorders have is very directly, that's what they said. But what my eating disorder or that negative thoughts that, 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 you know, crappy committee behind my ears that already was so loud and judgmental took it and said, well, they talked so much about weight loss. It must be that, but they're just being nice. So if yeah. any, anybody who's listening is part of the, the ballet world, they know people are not that nice in the ballet world. So <laughs> clearly, you know, that should have been my red flag, but I was already there in yeah. my mindset. And because eating disorders do run in my family, and we know that they're a biologically based brain disorder. My mother, they, they, my mother had uh, two sisters that experienced eating disorders. My, my father has a sister who has an eating disorder. So genetically, bio, biology was there. Yeah. And because I started on this restrictive diet, because my weight might have dropped a little bit under where my body set point was, it very much started. And then it was in that moment that I committed to do better. I again did not say I'm going to starve myself. It was, I'm going to do better. So next time there's not a question, I will get the role. Yeah. And uh, what actually reinforced my eating disorder as like, I take like a step forward into more of my story is the following year when I was engaging in my eating disorder, I got every single role. And so it very much solidified and gave that 
almost that reward of what you're doing is okay. In fact, here, everything you've ever wanted is given to you now that you're engaging in this eating disorder. Yeah. Yeah. Even if actually the the reality was you just done ballet for an extra year, you would have got that role. That's exactly right, Chris. Even yeah. even if you hadn't engaged in this, that that's not the the story that is is being told in the head. Exactly right. And so then in terms of ballet and, and then how that kind of continued on that, that you did reach a point where you quit ballet. So, so maybe talk about, about that. Yeah. So I actually further along, it was after my, my high school career, I was dancing professionally. I hadn't planned on going to university at all because I was going to be a ballet dancer. And I don't know, I don't, I don't think I ever thought past like, you know, the average career length of a ballet dancer, but I remember I moved out of my house and I, I moved to, to Orlando, which is about two and a half hours to the north of where I live. I lived and currently live. I was by myself for the first time. And at that point in my life, I had, I was living life in a much higher weight body because that was when I was actually engaging in bulimic behaviors as well as binge eating. I went to go see a physician who, a real MD who I was very direct about my eating disorder struggle and told her that I was too in my mind large to have a, a ballet career. Yeah. So she put me on a very strict diet, which I mean, could, literally was kryptonite for me. Yeah. And uh, it, it got me right back into restricting. And so I moved out of the house and my mother came to see my first production up there. And, you know, she saw how thin I was and basically said that, you know, her and my pediatrician who had known nothing about my eating disorder, but she consulted with him, believed that the ballet was causing um, my disordered eating is what they called it at the time. Yeah. And that clearly I would have to stop dancing. So my eating disorder ended up costing me my greatest love of my life up to that point, my, my career, my passion, my life. I mean, at the time, I mean, I would turn around and say all the time, like, if I can't dance, I don't want to live because it was my life. I went to a special art school. I danced, you know, five hours a day at night. Like I spent my summers in big companies. Yeah. And so I was completely lost at that time. And, you know, for so long, I had this, this dual identity, even though my eating disorder was never my identity and, and it's not anyone's identity, it sure has a way of making you feel like it is. And so yeah. I had the eating disorder and then I had the ballet and those were my two guiding, like that's how I would describe myself. Like if I really would even have the courage to say the eating disorder word out loud, but I definitely would say dance. And so yeah. when you take the, the ballet out of the picture, the only thing I had left was, that I felt was my eating disorder. And so that was really hard for me. And that's when I, you know, started engaging in my binge eating where I would just numb and stuff and, you know, use food to maladaptively cope with the anxiety, the depression, the loss. Um, and it was at that time that I also knew that, well, here I was, you know, age 19 living in a, in a city where I didn't know anyone and had a, had an apartment and, you know, my parents were very direct of like, you have to go to university. And so I went to the local university and I had this, this like heart to heart with the, with the person, with the, the person in admissions and said, you know, the only thing I know about more than ballet was my eating disorder. And if I ever do get better, I'm going to do everything in my power to help others. I know I'm not the first person and I know I'm not going to be the last. So I'm going to do everything I can. And I started university and I did, I used university in the same way that I didn't use food and used food. I used it to numb. I used it to, to, to maladaptively cope. So I took a, an, insane amount of classes. Um, and I got my degree that should have taken me four years in a little over two and a half. Yeah. Um, but I was dying inside. I was, I, I had suicidal ideations. I was depressed. I was binging and binging and binging. And I had this moment where I knew that the eating disorder would kill me. I had, I had lost people at that time already to their eating disorder. I knew that this was going to be the end of me. And I, had this moment of my my desire to see what life was beyond my eating disorder was a little bit more than my fear of change, my fear of letting go of my eating disorder, because I know you've probably talked about this and so many people that are listening can understand of 
my eating disorder held this really unbelievable role in my life. It was my yeah. best friend and confidant, but it was my worst enemy and the thing that was killing me at the same time. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was in that mindset of that, that devil, you know, is better than the devil. You don't. Yeah. But I had that moment of like, I, I just, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so that's when I made my first call for help. Nice. And and just, I mean, with the uni piece and and you saying, okay, I did four years in two and a half. Like, I think this is just so true of how the eating disorder is not just about food. Like it it morphs, it shifts, it it changes into whatever it it needs to. It was really interesting. I watched recently uh, the Anthony Bourdain documentary. Yes. Have you have you seen that Roadrunner? I haven't, but I've heard a lot about it. Okay. Well, he's someone who struggled with with heroin for a really long yep. time and then stopped heroin, but it just morphed into into lots of other lots of other addictions. And of some of them <laughs> appeared healthier than others. For sure. <laughs> but for sure. Like, yeah, he, he was he still never seemed to to get to get over that. Well, and I think, I mean, you make such a good point. It's like, you know, sometimes, and I really do believe in, and this is, this may not feel great for some people to hear, but, you know, there's, uh, along my last 22 years of running this organization, I've met people that say, you know, well, I had an eating disorder and then I, I, I just recovered on my own. One day I decided that I didn't want to insert whatever behavior that, that they did. And then I turn around and and the more that we talk, then they start sharing, well, you know, I then went to treatment for alcohol um, abuse and addiction, or, you know, I exercise X amount of hours every day, or I eat a paleo diet, or I do this, or I do that. And it's like, it's this idea, like what you were talking about, this symptom substitution, right? It's this game of whack-a-mole of like, perhaps the eating disorder is not the primary anymore, but what else are you using to maladaptively cope with all this stuff that's underneath because the eating disorder on some level, it's about the food, right? But it's really not. It's about, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's about the depression, the anxiety, the trauma, the comorbid stuff, like the, our society that we live in, that's extremely fat phobic, very diet centric that dictates what quote unquote health looks like or should look like social media, all of those factors, you know, and if unfortunately so many people do not get access to care and even more people don't get access to good care to really take a look and to be able to to get the tools to be able to healthfully work through all the other pieces. So of course, like someone who, if they weren't given the opportunity to get the treatment that they need, of course, they're going to keep on reaching out to whatever is going to continue to make them numb. I mean, for me, it was university, then it was drinking, and then it was shopping, and then it was whatever it was, because I just didn't want to feel. I didn't want, I I didn't want to feel as terrible as I did about myself. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, And it's like, when I reflect on the way that I work with clients, like in the beginning, it is very much about what you would think it would be about when you think of eating disorder recovery. So it's exactly. like, okay, how do we help in terms of nutritional rehabilitation? How do we help in terms of challenging food fears? Like all of the stuff that revolves around the food and the exercise that that seems very much connected to the eating disorder. But then it's like, okay, let's look at how this then plays out in relationships or how this plays out in all of these other aspects of your life, like how is the eating disorder still there? Because exactly. yeah, if you're not dealing with that at some point, this is going to to rear its head either as the eating disorder again or in some other some other way. Especially because like life is hard. Like there is going yeah. to be a death, there's going to be a divorce, there's going to be yeah. like there is going to be many opportunities for you to be in a situation when life is really knocking up against like where you feel like I just can't deal with this. And so, yeah, really having to like having explored all of those things in advance and continuing to explore all those things, I think Mm -hmm. is really important. Well, and I think, I mean, you bring up so many really great points. And I think one of the things that, you know, I, I say to people, I'm recovered, but yet I'm living in my life and, you know, you recover 
you do not recover to u- utopia. You recover yeah. to life and, and life is full of good and bad. And, and, you know, and I also know too that first of all, I have accountability humans in my life that I am, it's humbling almost at this point, right? Like if they ever see something, they need to say something of like, Hey, you know, Joanna, you doing okay. And like, yeah. of course your my first defense mechanism is always like, I'm fine. I'm fine. But to, you know, have the humility to say, you know, these are my most entrusted floaties in my life. If they're saying something, something might be going on, but it's also, I can never be too far away from my recovery to know that sometimes I may need to go back to basics, especially when it comes to nourishing myself, right? Like I am a human. If, if I like lean into my biology or my, my hunger and satiety that when I'm super stressed, my hunger goes away. Like that is not an eating disorder thing. That's a human being thing. Totally. And I also know that I don't have the luxury to be flippant about that, you know, where it's like, even if I may not be hungry and even if, if it doesn't physically feel good, I still have to nourish myself. I have to do that because, you know, there are certain things I know, like I will never, ever be able to go on a diet ever again. I will never be able to go to on the cleanse, on the fast. Like, you know, I'm, I'm of Jewish faith. Like I do not fast during the high holidays. It's, it's something that I, I have to, I, I have to do. And, you know, because I know that the intentions behind it are never good if I do it. Like, and I know that for me, one diet can lead to a slippery slope back to my, to my eating disorder. And I will tell you, I have come too far to only come this far and to go back to where I was because um, I'm, I'm sure many folks on this podcast have said it. Many of your patients have said it. You've probably said it as well as my, my best day in my eating disorder pales in comparison to my worst day in my, you know, in my recovery, because yeah. like uh, it's my life beyond my eating disorder is everything that my eating disorder was not. And so it means accountability. It means like, you know what, sometimes you got to do the things that like you just don't want to do. And one of the things that early on my dietitian said to me is you don't have to want to do something to, to do it. And that was a huge game changer for me, or you don't have to like doing something to do it. You know, yeah. I hated my recovery. It was the hardest thing that I ever did. Yeah. Like literally I tell people all the time. I'm like, if someone's telling you that recovery is the journey to recovery is great. They are lying to you. It sucks. It <laughs> really not sucks. Recovery is the, yeah. yeah. But it's also the best thing I ever did like bar none. So, you know, and that's why you need, that's why we're not meant to do this alone. That's why we, it's not like when you need it, reach out is don't when you need it, it's reach out. You need support. You're not, you're not supposed to recover on your own from an eating disorder. Just like you're not supposed to will a broken bone to heal. You go to the doctor, you get the treatments you need. Same thing. You get the support, you know, maybe people help carrying your, your bags, doing the, doing like the different things. The same thing with mental health. Mental health is health, period, end of story. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I'm totally in agreement with you on that. And and I also like as you said, you you, you have to know yourself. Like you you have to really start to learn. And and so yeah, like I, I know if I'm stressed or anxious, I don't feel particularly hungry. And I also know that if I don't eat, then it has a much bigger impact on me. So even though I don't necessarily feel hungry, I know that when I've eaten, I will feel better. If I don't, I don't sleep well. Like it has this knock on effect, even if I'm not getting the very obvious hunger cues. And as you said, for you, you know that the risk with that is far greater than the average person because you've been there. And so it's like just remembering that even in those moments when actually, okay, life feels really busy and chaotic and I've got this next meeting and then I've got that thing tomorrow. Like it doesn't matter. I still need to stop and have something to eat here. Exactly right. Yep. And so when you started starting psychology, like you obviously talked about having that meeting, what was the the end goal always like I want to work with eating disorders? <sighs> I think I wanted so much to talk to that seventh grade me who felt like she didn't deserve to take up space, uh, to be seen and heard. And there wasn't anybody talking about it. That's really what to me was, 
you know, I felt so othered. I felt so alone. And I know that for me, I think that so many things went wrong on my journey, you know, and in fact, I, I, I say this quite a bit is, you know, my experience ultimately became the blueprint of starting uh, the Alliance and the work that I do today. And it has, I mean, obviously it's grown far beyond me, but, um, you know, but that to me, it's like, I wanted I wanted to know why no one was talking about it. I wanted to know yeah. why I was doing this alone. I wanted to be in a room where people spoke my language because, you know, and I still see this to this day. Like, you know, you have, you have families that have, you know, God forbid they have children that have cancer or something going on, you know, here in the U S everyone brings them a casserole and they ask what they can do and, and all of the things. And, you know, you have a child that has an eating disorder and no one is there. There, No yeah. one, no one. And the, the the child with an eating disorder did not choose to have an eating disorder any more than the child that unfortunately has cancer. And so that was really my impetus of why are we not talking about this? Why is more not being done? You know, and so that was, that was really my mission. And I was getting ready to go to graduate school to get my PhD in clinical psychology. I had gotten into a program and that was really when for me, I was like, this is really what I want to do. I want to create change on a grassroots level. I want to go into schools. I want to talk to people. And so I called my parents up and I said, you know, mom, dad, I, I want to go to school, but this is really where my heart is. And so I took out a loan and I moved back home to the South Florida area and I, I opened the doors. I filed the papers to start the Alliance on October 15th, 2000. And I opened up the doors of the organization on December, on January 2nd, uh, 2001. And, you know, I always had this, this plan of going back to school and if it didn't work. Right. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've gone back twice. I haven't completed twice uh, <laughs> because my, my heart really has been in advocacy and yeah. I, in the work that I do. And, you know, it's been, it's been a really interesting road. It's been a very hard road. I never was a, a business minded human. I never was politically charged. I never, it was never my, I hated talking in front of people. I mean, you can put me on a stage to dance in front of 25,000 people. Fine. That's not a problem. You ask me to talk oh, terrible, terrible. Um, and along the way I found my voice that I had yeah. lost for so long and I found my passion and, you know, 22 years later, I'm so grateful and so humbled by the position that I'm in and the work that I do and being able to be part of the narrative, part of the story of someone else's recovery, because it's a rough road. I think, I yeah. think people don't really give credit to how hard this journey is. And, you know, I want to hold space. We want to be a support network and we also want people to know that it gets better, that there is truly life beyond eating disorders. Yeah. Yeah. And so just kind of going back to when you were first starting out with the Alliance, at that point, how much did your parents know about eating disorders? Like, well, obviously you'd been struggling for a while. You'd yeah. started to, to seek treatment. What had their role be? How much did they know this thing was like, was such a big thing in your life, not just from something you were suffering with, but you're like, I, I want to have this be my calling. I don't think honestly much. Um, so what's really right. interesting is I remember in college, I wrote this essay about my eating disorder and it was the first real time I put pen to paper. And I remember I let my parents read it and my mother cried. Yeah. My dad said, my, my father's never touched me. So let me just say that. But like he said, I should, I, I should have kicked your ass when this was going on so that you would have known better. That was his mindset, right? Like, yeah. let's fix this. And they are, to this day, my mother doesn't like to hear me speak because my mother on some level feels like she did something wrong okay. because of my eating disorder. My parents did nothing 
zero to contribute to my eating disorder more than just how they gave me brown hair and and brown eyes. They gave me the genetics, right? You know, definitely there was some temperament in the house, obviously the situation I shared about my dad and I, but my parents did not cause my eating disorder. So my, I, I, I very much know at this point, my parents are extremely proud of me. And, you know, every once in a while, my, my mother will, will say something to me that my dad has said to her about my work. And, you know, but it's, it's a different path that I chose, right? That, that yeah. they, that they wanted for me. You know, I mean, there are some things that I do, like I, I, I hold special positions within the U.S. government under health and human services. I spend time. I've spent time the last three White Houses working on the Hill. I, I do a lot of really cool things that I don't think that they would have ever imagined their daughter to do. And yeah. then on the same level, you know, I think it wasn't the path that I think they would have chosen for me. And I still think that they are, I hope that they're, they're pretty proud. Yeah. I, I would imagine that there's enough of the doing stuff in the white house to kind of tick that box for your dad of like, where, where yeah. he wanted yeah. you to get even if you're not doing nuclear physics or whatever it was right, exactly 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 <laughs> yeah and so with the alliance i mean obviously it has grown so much over these 21 years but is it doing now what it was doing in the beginning just on a much grander scale and this was always the the vision you know, honestly, where where the alliance is today is not at all. I, I think it blows my wildest dreams, very truthfully. I don't think I ever allowed myself to put out there or even, I would say, manifest or even just put out there what the organization is today. Something I wanted, I'm sure, on some level, but you know, it started for the first 10 years of the organization, I was a party of one. I was by myself. I had um, some amazing volunteers, but it was me. I was also working three jobs um, outside of the Alliance to keep the organization. Um, You know, now, I mean, we are definitely doing a lot of what we did, but on a much higher scale, but we're doing so much more than we had originally started out doing. Okay. Nice. And how do you manage your own mental health with <laughs> with this? Like, it, like we we talked obviously yeah. before about like how <clears throat> easily an eating disorder can morph into into other things, and and so yeah, ha- how does it not do that? Given you talk about three jobs and all all of those. Yeah, I mean, I would tell you that uh, very transparently at the beginning of the organization, I feel like the way that I worked was probably also a way of numbing and, yeah. you know, uh, continuing that. And, and I am for sure. I, I hear people all the time. I'm a, I'm a recovering perfectionist and it's something that I work on all the time. I don't think that I will ever um, move past that, but, you know, I'm trying to use some of like the evil for good as opposed, you know, for, for where I, I used to. But for me, it means having my, my weekly therapy session and very much knowing that I have the privilege of doing that. Yeah. Um, my story is I, I, and again, I would never like, this is just my experience is, you know, psychotropic medication was a, necess- was a necessity for me. Um, okay. and I, 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 I needed meds, um, because for me, like I had deficiencies in my brain and that, and that is exactly what the meds help with. Also having a support system that I can't even tell you, like for me, my eating disorder stole so much of my journey, so much of my life, but having really meaningful relationships that I don't have to always be the yes person anymore because I was the yes person for so long, showing up, doing everything for everyone, even if I was, you know, secretly um, resentful, just doing it because I was so afraid of letting other people down or being confrontational and not like in a negative way, but like letting my voice, my opinion be heard. And very truthfully, my partner, my husband, uh, we've been together for 19 years and he's my human in this journey. And he never ceases to lift me up and to support me and love me for me as imperfect as I am and letting me know that it's okay to be okay, even though I'm not this 
unrealistic, perfectionistic version of myself. Because even to this day, you know, I have these moments of why isn't the organization in a bigger place or why aren't we doing more? How am I failing? Am I the right person to lead this organization? But it's the things that I don't keep secret anymore. It's the things that I, I sort of bring out to the light because when you bring things to the light, they make it a little bit more tolerable and you're able to really work through them and push through them a lot easier. Nice. Well, yeah, I, I am totally in agreement with that in terms of speaking up about what's going on, not with the the thought that someone's going to fix it for you because that's not actually that's- what you need, but just being, I, I want to tell you this is what's happening. This is how I'm I'm feeling. It just, yeah, it, it stops resentments starting to to occur it, it it stops you sort of second guessing like i i'm yeah i agree with that that uh, bit of advice yep absolutely and so i want to talk about some of the 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 bits from your book in terms of different analogies and exercises and and things that you cover um, because i i think there was so much great information in here and i want to be able to share it with the listeners and so one of the, the things you talked about, and you've already kind of mentioned this a little bit in terms of your own experience, but just how much genetics are, are yeah. a part of eating disorders. And so, yeah, I, I wonder if you could just talk a little about that. Yeah. So we know that, you know, if you have a parent or a sibling of a parent that's had an eating disorder, you have a significantly more increased chance of of having of having an eating disorder as well as that you know they estimate that the that of all the all the causes of eating disorders about 50 50 to 80 percent is genetic and dr cindy bulick who's doing um research in uh, north carolina and in iceland she holds two positions is really the foremost researcher on re- researchers on genetic and it's truly remarkable because I will tell you when the research originally came out, I was a little bit, I was into my recovery. You know, it, this culpability because for so long I had this shame. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I caused this. I can't believe because I, I mean, I very clearly remember going on a, um, on a diet doing the things. And, you know, I was like, I can't believe that I caused this harm onto my family and myself, but having this knowledge that I did not choose this, this happened to me, just like a physical ailment really changed the course a lot for me. And when we start um, sharing that information with individuals and their loved ones, you see the same thing happen. It's like, okay, well, this is not something that I caused. This is not, this is not like, I don't need to blame myself. And this is why I need access to care. Yeah, definitely. And I do, I think the genetics piece is a really important thing to remember both for recovery and kind of going forward in terms of like we talked about before in terms of someone's tendencies um, of like, okay, cool. I I need to keep an eye on this thing. Cause like personally, I don't think I could just d- develop an eating disorder like anorexia because when I get hungry, it is so uncomfortable and unenjoyable. Like there is no part of me that thinks I want to keep going with this experience. But for someone who has the capacity to exactly. develop an eating disorder, mm-hmm. that is not their experience with it. Their, their yeah. experience is, is very different. And the early parts of that experience isn't saying, hey, let's stop. This isn't great. It's like, wow, this is some some calmness I haven't noticed before. Yes. Or this is like th- there is some very good positive feedback to keep doing this thing that the vast majority of the population doesn't get because they don't have the, de- the genetics that, that make that so. Oh, 100%. And something that, you know, you bring up that's so important is that restriction, restriction is the basis of all eating disorders, including yeah. binge eating disorder. And I think a lot of people don't realize that they're like, Oh, people with binge eating disorder just binge eat. But no, there's always that marked restriction that leads to the binging. And, you know, you're going to get some type, some type of something from doing that or else you wouldn't do it. And that's when like the biology comes in because like you said, a lot of people like, my husband, for example, he is hangry when he doesn't eat and like, you need to feed him ASAP and he, you know, and, and he will make no bones about it. And for me, if I actually leaned into what genetically 
I, I would be like, this is fine. This is just a feeling it'll pass. Like, you know, and that's where the difference, or I actually sort of like it, or it feels sort of whatever you feel, you know? So absolutely. And, you know, I also don't want to put it out there of like, well, if you, if you're genetically predisposed to having an eating disorder, there's really nothing you can do. You just have to go with it. That's not at all like what either of us are saying. It's no. just really for me, sharing about genetics is a way to make people feel less culpable or more of the idea of like, you're not bad for having an eating disorder. It's quite the opposite. Like this is happening to you. And that is why you deserve access to really good care. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Well, I also think it's useful to know because with eating disorders, a lot of people, and, and I'm included, like use the language of fully recovered. But even yeah. though you're fully recovered, that does not take away your genetic predisposition. No. And so you can be fully recovered living a, a, a good life where your eating disorder is not having an impact. But if you get back into an energy depleted state, there yes. you are again. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and that, and that's sort of why I, I talked about not going on diets and yep. when, I know that I'm being triggered in life. Like I have to go back to basics. And, you know, as someone who's, you know, lived on the side of recovery for 23 years, it's humbling to be like, okay, let me go back to like my old school in my head, like meal plan. Cause I did have a meal plan. I know some like, like for me, I do believe in intuitive eating, but originally I had to go into some type of a meal plan to like, you know, start to lean into my hunger and satiety a little bit more. And it's like, have I nourished myself? Have I, for me, and again, everyone is different, was three meals, three snacks. That's what I had to do on my journey. And and and, and I really should caveat, that was when I was struggling with binge eating disorder because a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, that's not like that's only for restricting anorexia nervosa. No, like for me, it's again, I my my basis of my binge eating was I was restricting. I was restricting all day and then I was binging at night. So I had to normalize eating meals consistently. But for me, it's leaning back into that. Okay, I know what I need to do. I have yeah. to do this right now. Even if every cell in my body's like I really don't want to do this. It's like, well, I need to do this because I am surely not going to go back to where I was. Yeah, definitely. And so one of the analogies you use in the book is the the drawer analogy with, with the different yeah. choices. So yeah, talk, talk about, talk about this. So that's actually one of my most favorite analogies and I'm a very visual person. And so when my therapist started talking, like on, when I finally connected with a therapist that, that really worked for me, when she started talking about theory it didn't really work, but when she was like, okay, imagine like a box of crayons or imagine this, it like really connected. I'm a very, like very, very much visual in, in that, in that vein. Yeah. So I remember this was actually post my recovery journey. I was getting ready to go into a meeting that was, I knew was going to be somewhat, I don't want to say confrontational, but not where I could just placate everyone. And so yeah. I literally went to the worst case scenario and I was like, I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. And it was very similar to a lot of people when, um, you know, they would take risks, right? Like whether it was with their dietitians or with their therapist or so, you know, I had a, a dear friend of mine say to me, she goes, I want you to imagine you're standing in front of seven drawers. So all seven drawers. I want you to tell me the best case scenario of what can happen. And I shared with her the situation and she said, that's not good enough because that is not what you, your best case scenario would be in your black and white dichotomous brain. And so to give you an idea, like you're considering a job, right? Like you have to go in for a job interview. Best case scenario. Well, we would, you know, uh, we're probably like, okay, so you get the job. That's not big enough. Uh, you go into interview for the job with the CEO of this major company. The CEO looks at you and says, oh my goodness, you are the best human ever. You should be the CEO. I'm going to give you 3 million pounds a year to like, you know, do you and that's it. So that's top, top scenario. And then, you know, she was like, tell me, tell me bottom drawer. And I was like, well, you don't get the job. And she said, think about your top drawer. So she goes, so bottom drawer would be like, not only do you not get the job, but you don't get the job, you lose your job that you're working at and they take your house and your dog, like worst case scenario, right? Like, I mean, yeah. worst thing that you can imagine, like, and so she's like, so tell me middle drawer. And I was like, okay. 
And so middle drawer in our, in the, in the job situation is you get the job, but maybe you have a three month probationary period, right? And you meet people and then you like them. And there's some people that you might not get along with, but overall it's a, it's a good experience. And so that to me, that seven sets, the seven set of drawers became a real great exercise for when, you know, individuals that I was connecting with, that I'm working with, as far as like when they were taking risks on their journey to recovery or trying something new, as I, I like to say, is tell me the absolute best case scenario, which is top drawer, the absolute worst case scenario, and then give me bot like the middle drawer because the majority of life lives in that middle drawer. The majority of things happens in drawers three, four, and five. And that made it a little less scary to do the hard things. Yeah. And I think when I think about recovery, the goal isn't that in life you are then just going through where you're in the the top handful of drawers. It's that you then learn the resilience and the ways to cope and the ways to be so that really whatever drawers you're coming up against, you're still able to make it through. And yes, exactly. if you had your your pick, you would pick it that it's going to happen this way and this way. But actually you you truly believe and you you have lived experience by being able to come up against tough things that actually I can get through this. Exactly. Exactly. So it and it's knowing that also, because I think that for me, I feel like where I, where I am right now, how I'm feeling right now is going to last forever is realizing that there's always movement between the drawers, always, right? You're not going to be stuck in a drawer ever. Um, so just to continue to, to give yourself that space and grace to, to give yourself the opportunity to be able to move through the drawers. Yeah, definitely. And even, I mean, a lot of the work that I do with clients and, and talk about is connected to a thing called polyvagal theory and like yep. knowing where you are on your nervous system. So even when you think about that that job situation and what that would be like, knowing that if I'm at the top of the ladder and in a good state, I will feel differently about how that exact same outcome feels versus when yeah. I'm at the bottom of the ladder and, and in shutdown. And so realizing, okay, well, what what state are you also in when you're thinking about this? Like I had an experience with a client last week and we realized that when she was getting into a panic with things, whether it be her job or her body image or whatever, was actually always when she was hungry. And when she ate and she Amazing. was no longer in that state, she felt differently about it. And I was like, okay, great. Well, like now you have this level of awareness of just how dependent and state dependent your thoughts and feelings are. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And it's, it's that insight, you know, so often that to me, it's, I, we always, so I, I, I co-facilitate several of our groups weekly. And one of the things that, that we share all the time is, you know, awareness is such a big part Definitely. of life, right? Like yeah. it's so part of the recovery journey and it's life. And like, you know, we were actually talking about this last Monday in group of like, yeah, but it's just awareness. You're not really changing. And I'm like, but before you can change, you need to have that awareness because it's sort of like, you know, playing Monopoly and just sort of sailing around the board, just con con like consistently, like not passing go, not collecting $200, just sort of going, right? And yeah. and this awareness makes you stop. I Like that pause is so, so important. So if anybody's listening to this and that, that finds themselves in that space of like, okay, well, I have awareness, but yet I'm still acting out in a behavior. I just want to say that's phenomenal because awareness is really that key step. That pause yeah. is that key step, right? And then, and I always believe all the time that the trips and the falls are meant to be there because you learn from that. And, you know, that's, I mean, some of, some of the things that I've learned and hold so dear to my, to, to my heart are lessons I learned when I was, I mean, so far down, right? So, so far down, yeah. but it's giving me, it's just giving me that opportunity to learn and, and collect those tools to have this tangible toolbox to be able to successfully navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, and I think, especially as things are starting to get better, it's when you have those relapses or regressions or step backs or however you want to phrase it, it's at those points that you realize, oh, that thing really was making a difference or that like, because you can kind of forget how much things have changed because it feels like it's glacially slow. Yeah. And then it's when something kind of snaps you out of that, that you're like, 
oh, okay, now, like, I realize how important that thing I was doing is that I kind of was taking for granted. Oh, my gosh. And then you also, you bring such a good point up is this idea of, like, please don't ever minimize your successes, your wins, because, you know, for me in that black or white, like that, that, that chest of seven drawers, like unless something was in the top drawer, it was like, well, it's not good enough, (laughs) but that is actually the contrary. You know, these huge leaps are made out of like all these different baby steps. And so I challenge you to take a step back and take a look at all the things that you've been able to do take off your perfectionistic colored lenses. And like, I mean, we talk about this in group all the time. Like there was a time in my life where getting out of bed was insurmountable, could not do it. And so for me, like this idea of like getting out of bed, that was a, that was a recovery win. And of course, like me to my therapist was like, okay, everyone gets out of bed and I am not celebrating that. And like, is the bar so low that that's what you're telling me to like be happy about? And she said, but that was not your reality. That is not your story. Yeah. And so just whoever's listening to this is, is please give yourself grace and give yourself the opportunity to pat yourself on the back for all the small wins that you do, right? Like whether it's listening to this podcast, reaching out to your team, if you have the privilege of having one, reaching out to a friend when things might not be great. Um, those are huge recovery wins. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's when you then stack those things on top of one another that it then does move further forward and you get that i think i talk often with clients about the more you're able to to move forward when things regress you have a point of contrast where something is now different like if you haven't got out of bed for for 12 years and that has now become your reality it's hard to see something different but when you then had three months of getting out of bed every day and doing a lot more and then you find yourself back in bed there's a there's now more of a, uh, it's more jarring because yes. you've had this different experience. Yep, exactly, exactly. And so one of the other things you talk about in the book, and you 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 mentioned it briefly in passing already, was like sinkies and, uh, sinkies and floaters uh, or yeah. floaties. Um, so yeah, ex- explain what this is. Yeah, when I was actually writing the book, I happened to be in, in Washington, D.C., and I was at my my husband's cousin's house and, you know, I was watching at the time their daughter was was so young and she had those water wings right on. Yeah. And it was she was just throwing herself, um, throwing herself in the pool. And, you know, her parents had one eye on her, but they knew that these water wings were keeping her afloat. And I started thinking about how eating disorders sort of give you that narrative, right? Like, Eating disorders are maladaptive coping mechanisms. They have a function. They serve a function, not even a question. They come along in your life at a time where you need to be kept afloat. So I want to definitely give space to that. Sort of like those water wings, right? They keep you above water. Yeah. But what the eating disorder actually does is at some point it does like a bait and switch where it's like, I'm going to keep you afloat. But then what it really does is it turns into what I like to call like a sinky. It's like the thing that's actually going to bring you down. So like... Uh, it's almost like it's like originally like they're water wings, but ultimately they're a weight that 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 drops you down. And so what I encourage people to do is to because we definitely need the things that are going to keep us afloat. So make a list of what are the things, the people that actually keep you afloat. Is it your friends? Is it your family? Is it your pets? Is it your university? Is it your 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 work? What is it? You know, and then one of the things that I also ask people to do when they're talking about sinkies and floaties is to also put together what I like to call a smile list. And I, I've been writing these for, for years and they change, um, because, you know, nothing is written in indelible ink, right? You, you change, you live, you think new things happen. Like I remember when I wrote the book over a decade ago, like to me, the things that made me smile was like, I had a little dog at the time, Sammy who every time I used to talk to him, he would cut, like he was turn his head, like he was like listening to me or, you know, little things would happen. You know, now my smile list is like just thinking about like looking into my daughter's eyes and, yeah. you know, her little giggle. My dog now, Teddy, who like literally is, is like the, the, he's Eeyore from, you know, Winnie the Pooh. Like he's just a sad dog, which is so hysterical and amazing. He's a wonderful, but write down the things that make you just 
when you read it, put a smile because in those hard moments where you feel like you have nothing to smile about, we need those tangible reminders. Yeah. And I think also not just having that list, like that list then might make you go over and look at your dog or go exactly. over and look at your daughter. Like it, it's, it's a reminder because I, again, I think when you're feeling great, the awareness is there that those things help you. And when you're not, the awareness disappears and it feels like, well, that's not going to really make a difference or like, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter. And I mean, kind of connected in the same way you talk about like writing letters to yourself for again, to, to be able to read when, when you're not feeling so, so good, or it doesn't feel like things are progressing the way you would like to just as a reminder of like, this is how far we've come and things are really great. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, the other, the other list that I would highly, highly suggest doing is like what I now call like almost like, do you know those, those things that are on the wall that like have a little glass and it says like, you know, shatter in case of emergency yes, and pull yes. the thing is creating one of those lists, like uh, tools that you, things that you can do when you are at a four or five, six up, upwards of like, you know, you're feeling very activated. You want to act out. You can't think of like tools on the spot. So having that list and don't just have one or two things, have a big list so that if yeah. one or two doesn't work, you can go to three and four. This is the most important thing though. Do not only use that in case of emergency. You need to know there's reasons why like at a, at a location they'll do like fire drills or they'll do like to get you used to doing them. We have an amazing number of group that said so brilliantly about two months ago, I come to group when I'm doing well. So I know how to come to group when I'm not. Yeah. And that is that is such a great reminder. So write down your list and don't be shy to do your list of tools when things are going well so that you'll know how to use them. You'll know how to break that proverbial glass when things are not going well. Definitely. And I'd also add, if you're doing them when things are going well, you are building up your window of tolerance so that more often than not, you're going to continue doing well, or it's going to take more to knock you off your perch because you're regularly having these things that are supporting yourself. And that's exactly that's, right. Like, exactly the only right. time you try and do meditation is the point at which like everything feels like it's falling apart. Like you're never going to succeed at meditation because you're, you're trying to do it at an almost impossible point. Whereas if you are practicing these things, when it is easier, when it gets more difficult, you've, you, as you say, like you've got a better shot of it actually being able to help. Without a doubt, you know, and then it becomes almost second nature. So it doesn't feel so foreign and so uncomfortable to do it. Yes. Yes. And you, there, there was a really great analogy as well with the ignorant stamp. And I think yeah. this w- is something that I w- will use with clients a yeah. lot now that I've read it. So yeah, talk, talk about this one. Yeah. So the ignorant stamp, uh, it, like it just, it makes me smile whenever I talk about it. The ignorant stamp came out of a situation that happened in group. There was a, a group member who garnered the courage to share with her medical provider that she had an eating disorder and his response was very fat phobic, was very uh, like just, it was just harmful and offensive. Uh, he made a comment that, you know, I mean, you could imagine what, what he yeah. said. And so she was crying and she was like, I'm so angry with myself. And I said, well, this is not about what something that you did wrong. It was about how the information was received. I said, if you could go back to that moment, what would you do? She, what would you like to do to that doctor? And she said, I want to punch him. And I'm like, well, I understand in my head, but you know, violence, let's not do that. I said, is there anything else that we could do to make, to make his words not so penetrable and becoming, you know, that narrative that's in your head now? And she said, absolutely not. There's nothing. And I said, well, imagine you were standing in front of him and he had a word written on his forehead. What would it be? And I will tell you, I'm not going to, rec- I'm not going to recite what she said it was highly offensive and very appropriate, but just not, not PG 13, as I like to say. Um, and so I'm like, okay, absolutely. Yes. And I said, but what about it? And she said, it was just so damn ignorant. And I'm like, okay. So the thing is that sometimes ignorance is not meanness. Ignorance is just not knowing. And sometimes it's meanness. So let me just say that. But a lot of times it's just ignorance. So I said, imagine that in big red ink on his forehead, the word ignorant 
was written and she just started laughing and she goes, it doesn't feel as heavy. Yeah. And so that's how the ignorance stamp was, was born. So I said, so moving forward, imagine you have this rubber stamp that has the word ignorant in red ink. And every time someone says something that's triggering something on social media, imagine you're just stamping that port, that person with an ignorance stamp. And so now whenever you see them, all you can see is a word ignorant and it's not so much. Now I just, I always have a disclaimer. You can definitely go out and make an ignorance stamp, but please don't actually stamp. <laughs> like, like, just please don't do that. But yeah, it's just a really great, like, it's a really great analogy to use, a very great tool. And many of the people that I've worked alongside have actually made them stamps, um, rubber stamps that they can keep either in their purse, in their backpack. And then every time something feels a little triggering, they can like actually touch it because it's a very grounding moment for them. Yeah. And imagine like stamping them with an ignorance stamp. Yeah. And I love, I mean, I actually love the the physical part of that where you said, okay, we got these made up and I could actually touch it in that, in that moment. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because it does, it, 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 with this, it, it shifts it from this is about me to this is about the other person. And, and so often in those moments, it doesn't feel like it's about the other person. It, it, like the eating disorder thoughts come up and, and make this like all the reasons why you should have done X, Y, and Z or why you shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z and make it about about you when actually it's, it's really not about you. And it, it kind of reminded me of w- within acceptance and commitment therapy, mm-hmm. There's a thing where if you're having certain thoughts that are arising, repeating yourself like, oh, there's there's that thought again and, and making it a category of thought. And so it could be, yeah. well, there's that weight loss thought again. And yeah. by just making it that category of thought, it, it instantly says to you, I don't actually have to entertain this. I don't have to justify it. I don't have to do anything with it. I categorize it as that thought and I can then just move on. And I think it's the same here of like, okay, I put it into the category of this is an ignorant thought. I don't now have to spend the next 10 minutes, two hours, three days, whatever it is, like in this battle with my eating disorder about this. I love that. And I will tell you, ACT really changed my my recovery and my really my life, I would say, because, you know, originally I was really, you know, I was brought up on a, on a really like CBT version of, you yep. know, of treatment of, you know, you have a thought, you do a negative that the counter, the, 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 the counter thought to that. And like, it became so big in my head, right? It was sort of like, I mean, I, I, I say this like the way, the best way I can explain it. Cause I am so visual. It's like, you know, you have a blemish on your skin and you know, you shouldn't touch it, but you can't help yourself. So you continue to like, mess with it. And soon it's so much bigger than it was originally because you couldn't stop touching it. Right. And for me, act was like realizing that that negative thought might never go away. And that gave me freedom of like, okay, there's nothing wrong with me that I still have this thought. Right. But it's this idea of exactly what you said is like acknowledging your thoughts saying, okay, I hear you. I may see you and I'm choosing to do something else. This idea of like, I can choose to do something else. And I think for so many people with eating disorders, with the fact that, you know, eating disorders are not obviously disorders of choice, this idea of choosing, I hear you and I can do something else. And very honestly, like I still have a lot of, I I call it the quote unquote shitty committee between my ears, right? Because it's, um, I will have it. That's who I am. That's how I'm wired. And I can choose to do something different. I don't have to sit there and counteract every negative thought I have with uh, the opposite. I can say, I hear you. I he- I, that's fine. And I'm doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the acceptance and commitment therapy is a big part of the way I work with clients and even for myself, I like, I, I don't have a needing sword, but I still have a brain that throws up lots of thoughts. And I think for sure, that the the mindfulness aspect of this of just realizing like I'm not the author of my thoughts I am just a witness love that. this th- this thought that has come into my consciousness and, and being aware of that of like well that doesn't th- if this thought has just been auto generated I don't have to say that I believe it it doesn't mean that this is part of my identity it doesn't mean this is part of my values any of those things it's just there is just this automaticity of this thing just coming up in me and and being able to notice that and realize that then allows you to like check in like is this a helpful thought no it's not okay cool I'm going to put it to the side or yes it is great let's explore this further 
I love that. Absolutely. And so the final thing that I want to get you to to talk about is just writing an ad for The Healthy Voice. I I really love this one. Yeah. So that one came out of, you know, it it actually, and there's even more of a backstory than even what I shared in the book is, you know, I, I think so much of my, of what recovery looked like was so foreign to me. It's this idea of, you know, we talk about these re- recovery wise, like, why do you recover? And to be very honest, like, I didn't know why I was recovering. I didn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm recovering because I want to have this career or I want to have children or I wanted any of that. Like, it wasn't that. Like, so to me, one of the things that sort of started this whole, like, the advertisement for a healthy voice was realizing, well, what do I, what do I know, which is my, my eating disorder and what do I hate about my eating disorder? And then go from, go to the opposite of that. So, you know, we talk so much about the ed voice, right? The, that, that negative eating disorder thought, um, people call it all different things. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that I realized is that it's, it's sometimes it's hard to fight that, uh, that, that unhealthy voice. And so one of the things that was a very helpful tool to me was imagine if you had a healthy voice, a healthy entity, if you will, like sort of, so in that same vein of like recovery wise, not knowing why I was recovering, I didn't know what a healthy voice would look like. Truthfully, I knew what a what a negative voice would look like. Yeah. And so I started with this idea of okay, if I were to write an advertisement for a healthy voice, what would that look like? So I had to start with if I was writing an ad for what an unhealthy voice looked like, you know, being loud and pushy and rude and and violent and just abusive, all of that. And then flip that and so allowing yourself an opportunity to write a voice that was supportive, patient. I, I like, I mean, I've the ad has changed for me so many times over the years, right? Like inclusive, you know, not perfect, a cheerleader in a sense. And literally, I I did this, I did this um activity where I actually put together an ad and it was a way for me to sort of put it out there of what I wanted. And and for some people, once they, once they have this ad, then they're able to name this entity, this positive voice. And yeah, some of the things like some of the people that I've worked with, you know, over the years have been, you know, they'll, they'll name it like the incredible Hulk or, you know, different names. And for me, my healthy voice, I named it Rosalie um, after my, my grandmother um, because she was the epitome of strength, right? And uh, what was so special to me is um, when I when I had my daughter, her middle name is actually Rosalie now. And and because I want for her all those things that I wrote in my ad so many years ago, yeah, she deserves that, and I want that for her. Nice, nice. And I think sometimes it is easier to say, okay, well, how would you speak to a small child? And so imagining that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but I just like the the way that you go through this exercise and then have all of these uh, characteristics that you would you would want, and then when a different voice turns up, you you can be the the, the HR team of like, is this is this the yeah. kind of person that I want for this for this job? And it's not that you then overnight start speaking to yourself no. differently, but it's you can notice when the qualities that you want are there and when the qualities aren't that, that, that you don't want are there. Exactly. I love that. And again, sort of bringing a full circle to our conversation today is this idea that it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be black and white. You're not going to go from hearing this really, this voice that has that's living rent-free in your brain to all of a sudden having this overtly supportive and wonderful voice like it's not going to happen it's just and probably some aspects of that 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 negative voice are always going to be there but you also can bring in the the reinforcements by how having that healthy voice internally and externally as well yeah yeah definitely well look joanna this has been such a wonderful conversation i i feel like we barely touched uh, the topics in in your book, and I highly recommend that people go and check it out. There's lots Thank of you. analogies and exercises, and and there's definitely stuff that I will be using with clients from Wonderful. Because, of, because of reading this. So, where should people go if they want to find out more information about you? Yeah, absolutely. I would suggest people can log on either uh, to our website, which is allianceforeatingdisorders.com. 
Um, they can visit us on all social platforms um, under at Alliance for ED. And one of the things that we just want to offer uh, for everyone is we have free weekly therapist-led support groups for individuals experiencing eating disorders as well as their loved ones. We have people from all 50 states in the United States that attend and 71 countries around the world. Uh, we have so many folks from the UK that join. So it's there. It's a free service. The groups are wonderful. And so you can find us, you can find the Alliance um, on those platforms um, and never feel free to reach out. Uh, we have an amazing, amazing team of humans doing the most incredible work. I really am, am privileged to work with the best of the best. Nice. Well, look, I will put all of those resources in, in the show notes. And yeah, thanks again for coming on. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. So that was my conversation with Joanna. She really is doing such amazing work and there are so many resources over at the Alliance site. So if you enjoy today's show, then check out the site and also check out Joanna's book, Life Beyond Your Eating Disorder. So I have a recommendation for something to check out. It is a documentary called Val, which is all about the actor Val Kilmer. So Val Kilmer now is in his early 60s, and in more recent years, he has struggled with throat cancer and had a procedure that means he now has to speak with a voice box. But all throughout his career, he had a video camera with him in his everyday life, on the set of all his movies. He seemed to just document everything. And so this documentary is a look back at his life and with his son doing the narrating for it. So it's a lot of archival footage pieced together with now how he's living his life and, and what's going on. And I found him just to be a real fascinating human, to feel the need to constantly film everything, whether it was of himself or of others, and just to see how his life has, has played out. I didn't know a huge amount about Val Kilmer before the film. I knew of him from films like Top Gun and The Saint, and I knew that he played Jim Morrison in a film about the doors, but I hadn't seen it. But even though I knew little about him, I still found it a great documentary, and I don't think you need to know much about him. He kind of gets covered, and it's just really well put together. It has an incredible soundtrack, and that would kind of be like a second recommendation connected to this, which is to actually check out the soundtrack. It's got a lot of listens for me since I saw the film. There's obviously a lot of The Doors on it, but also Brian Eno, Gary Newman, Bob Dylan, John Lennon, uh, Nick Drake, uh, The Velvet Underground, Aphex Twin, and a really beautiful piano version of Pixies, Where Is My Mind? So if you want something to listen to or something to watch, then I recommend Val. And that is it for this week's show. I'll be back next week with another show. Until then, take care and I'll catch you soon.